This is JCU Conversations, a podcast show from James Cook University, Singapore. Tune in as we ask experts in the industry more about their lives and their approach to success. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's listen to today's episode. Hi, I'm Associate Professor Denise Dillon, Acting Dean Research, Associate Dean of Research Education, and Associate Professor of Psychology from James Cook University, Singapore. Our guest today is Professor Andreas Lapata. Andreas Lapata is a professor in biochemistry at the Tropical Futures Institute, James Cook University, Singapore. He leads the Molecular Allergy Research Laboratory in the Australian Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine at James Cook University, Australia. Welcome, Andreas. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks very much, Denise. Thanks for the introduction uh, and all those long names and complicated <laughs> and all. Uh, thanks. Let's see what we can learn about you today. So firstly, tell us more about what you do. Yeah, look, in a nutshell, uh, uh, I'm a molecular biochemist. Uh, uh, probably that's the best kind of um, identification of, of my profession. But what we are doing, we're working on allergic reactions. Uh, so within the field of molecular biology, we're looking at allergies and very particular on food allergies to seafood. Mm -hmm. So most of our research is around developing better diagnostics. So helping clinicians and consumers of food, and also developing immunotherapy, so treating people which have already seafood allergy. And we do this right here in Singapore. Fantastic. And I see you do that with children and adults as well. Yes, that's true. I think uh, most of the food allergy we know in the past was focused around children. Now we know adult food allergy is as common as in children. So that's our focus now in the next decade, I would say. So what inspired you to pursue a career in biological science? Tell us a mm. bit more about your journey. Yeah, yeah. The, my journey was probably very different from most of the other uh, molecular biologists I know in the field. So I started off actually starting studying business uh, in a business school in Germany. So that's, and you have also a big business school I know here at JCU. So I started this, but after two years, actually my passion was always in biology. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to swap and change over to a biological science degree. Mm -hmm. But to do this, I actually had to do bridging courses in Ouch. English, in mathematics, <laughs> although really in the basic stuff. Took me an extra half a year to do this. But then I was able to study biology and that was really fantastic for me. That changed my, my whole future career and life in this field. And I he I've heard you say that you were the happiest student on campus as a yes, result of uh, that. Uh, that was really <laughs> unbelievable. Also, it was a long journey to get there, what I really wanted to do. And I was uh, super happy. That's true. And then all the these different subjects we had to do were actually very fun and not, oh uh, not a burden. <laughs> <laughs> not everybody's cup of tea, but yeah, certainly yours. True. So transitioning from studying business to mm. research in medical sciences can be quite a significant leap. Mm. How did that shift come about? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a leap, uh, but I have to start off that I always was interested in nature and animals. And before I went to the business school, I thought I don't have the opportunity to study biology because I didn't have the prerequisition to mm -hmm. go at uh, German universities. Mm -hmm. They have, have a certain guidelines, but only afterwards, after I studied uh, business, uh, basically I was able to uh, adhere to these guidelines basically, and this enabled me to study what I always wanted around nature and, and the animals. Fantastic. And I'm subsequently then working on seafood. So was that initially part of your interest or did that come yes. about later? I mean, that's come a little bit later. I mean, uh, nature and animals within in the middle of Germany, seafood is not really a central <laughs> thing, you know, besides the stuff you find in rivers. Yeah. Uh, so I moved actually to uh, South Africa for a while and studied insects. Yeah, so insect, insect physiology, biochemistry, molecular stuff again. And there, of course, in Cape Town University, you have two different oceans, actually. So they are got really exposed to um, the field of marine uh, biology, I will say, and the small field of seafood allergy. Okay, so tell us a little known fact about mm. food allergens. What's one surprising fact mm. that we, sh we wouldn't know? Yeah, that's, it's a good question. Uh, and, and I think the most surprising we over the years, what I have seen is this really shift uh, in recognizing that adults actually have food allergy. Mm -hmm. So as I said, 20 odd years ago, uh, allergies in children to uh, peanut, uh, egg, milk, that was the, the study topic. 
I started off on seafood, which nobody really worked on. That was absolutely novel at the time. Mm. Now we know that about 10% of all adults, including here in Singapore, have absolutely a true, we call it food allergy, not just adverse reactions. Mm. And that's really uh, has been supported by lots of studies in China and studies in the USA, uh, as well as in Europe. So really not just our work, but also other uh, countries and universities and groups show the same adult food allergy, absolutely common and on the rise, unfortunately. I was really surprised. Two of my own sisters have allergies to mangoes. How cruel All is that? Right. Yeah, and they didn't develop it until they were at least mm -hmm. uh, a teenager and, and one in her 20s. So definitely I can see adults Yeah, that's very suffering. interesting. Also with, with <laughs> exotic fruits, I mean, especially <laughs> when you live in the tropics, uh, that, that could be quite uh, life-changing, especially mm. mangoes in North Queensland or if yeah. you live in India, for example. Yeah, but we see this exotic fruits is a very good uh, uh, question because uh, we see in a lot of adults they have inhalant allergy. So mm. allergies to certain pollen. They're coming from grass or from lots of trees, different plants. And we know now there's a lot of molecular cross reactivity. Again, over the last 20 years, we know that certain tree pollen are very similar to certain allergens in, fr in uh, fruits uh -huh. or in food in general. So mango, I think there was a, a strong cross reactivity with certain pollens. So there could be this cross reactivity that your sisters also actually allergic to certain pollen, which is very seasonal often. And then this allergy translates also to some food allergy, which is exotic like mango or latex. It's another one, which is very common, latex and mango. Uh, sorry, mango and uh, coconuts, I think. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. See, it's fascinating asking somebody who knows, because mm. you're right. My sister does have... Um, she sneezes every time she dusts or sweeps yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. So probably amazing. So you said you spent some time in South Africa. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, this was very early in my career when I did my bachelor's in, in biological sciences in Germany. My, my professor, I was working as a student there to get some extra money. He got a, a position in Cape Town University in South Africa. So I followed Tim. He offered me a master thesis uh, opportunity for a year and a half. So I worked there on insects, so the flying metabolism of insects, or so the flying beetles, basically. And again, using molecular biochemical methods to analyze it. And that's why I landed up in South Africa. Subsequently, I did a PhD in, in food allergies. There mm -hmm. I went into abalone. Mm -hmm. so that was my topic. I met my wife. She was also working in abalone, but aquaculture in Cape Town University. We got married, we got two kids, and we lived there over 15 years I lived in South Africa. What an amazing story. Yeah. What I'm really interested in as well, though, is South Africa, most people go to for the large exotic animals, mm. and you went down to the micro level yes. looking through microscopes. Yeah. How did that come about? <laughs> yeah, again, it's, I think it's a seafood, because as I said, uh, Cape Town University has two different oceans on the left side, right side, so uh, there was a lot of aquaculture, marine research there, mm. so... It was kind of logical not looking at lions and, and, <laughs> and uh, allergies to rhinos, <laughs> but looking really on seafood. And abalone, we had a lot of patients coming into the hospital with allergies to abalone. So okay. it's a kind of delayed allergy, we call it. You know, you have in the evening you eat something and then middle of the night you get allergic reactions. Uh, and nobody did any research on this. So there mm -hmm. was no idea how to diagnose it. So my PhD was really very novel. Now we have thousands of publications uh, literally in the field of seafood uh, and that was very different at the time. So that was probably the challenge. It was something novel and the opportunity to work with marine organisms at the university. I guess it's fortunate in a way, since you're interested mm. in food allergies, that people aren't interested in looking at yeah. food allergies of lions and hippos because we exactly. don't want people to be eating them, <laughs> right? <laughs> So you've worked in food allergy since your PhD, which was over 20 years ago. So you've got so much experience. What's the most eyebrow-raising change you've witnessed mm. along the way? I didn't know it's so long, actually 20 years. <laughs> that's, that's, more than. More than. That's even more <laughs> shocking. But uh, I think the, the, the fact, uh, firstly, that uh, adults having so much uh, food allergy mm. and not just children, I think opens a whole new field also in the diagnostics. And in doctors, mm -hmm. most of the pedi uh, allergy specialists, clinical allergy specialists are actually pediatrician, mm -hmm. uh, not actually adult uh, doctors. And the second astonishing fact, again, not only coming from our group, was in, a, in the US and in China finding that seafood is the number one 
food allergen amongst adults. Mm. So it's not peanut or milk or egg, what children often have, mm -hmm. but it's shellfish and fish. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah, and so many people want that. So you mentioned before that when you did your PhD, there were almost no publications in the area. Yes. And subsequently, over the decades that you've been working mm. on it, it's now well accepted that JCU is the leading Yes. Um, well, you yourself are one of the leaders in this area. How has that developed? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I work, as I said, on seafood really since my PhD in, in various angles. And uh, when I came to, to Australia in 15, 16 years ago, uh, I continued working on, on seafood with clinicians in, in Melbourne and uh, Sydney, mm -hmm. where they also see a lot of children with seafood ah. allergy. So we had a large study. So over 100 children with fish allergy and analyzed it and developed better diagnostics. And we work now also in shellfish, as I said, here in, in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Singapore shellfish allergy is the number one food allergens, definitely amongst adults, but also frequently amongst children. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's a topic there. That's why we uh, are so good internationally. We are, I think, probably the leading lab uh, in, in the world. But it's not just me. I mean, I have the interest and I encourage other students to do it, but it's always a teamwork. So mm -hmm. we have a large team here in Singapore and in Australia working on this, and we have a large international network of collaborators working in this field and trying to solve unknown puzzles, how to improve diagnostics and mm -hmm. help people not uh, uh, actually dying really of seafood because that's the worst which can happen and it does still happen frequently. So important. And you've moved into novel foods, I understand, as well. So you talked about cross-reactivity. Mm, yeah. I understand that you and your team were the first to come up, will understand that there's something to do with eating crocodile meat now, which is a oh, relatively yes. new food. Mm, exactly. So uh, alternative proteins, I mean, that's, that's a big drive in the last, I would say, six years. Uh, mm. We know we can't use just traditional ways of aquaculture or land use, having enough plant proteins and animal proteins. So we have to move into other kind of alternatives, I would say. Mm -hmm. And crocodile, it's it's not necessary that people starting eating crocodile, but cultivated meat uh, okay. is, is one big area we're working with companies here in, in Singapore. Cultivated meat, uh, we basically create meat from stem cells from different animals. Mm -hmm. And it can be reptiles, it can be fish, it can be oh, shellfish. Gosh. And we need to about know, to, uh, know about the food safety aspects of the allergen aspects. And that's, again, internationally, we are one of the leading causes. Uh, toxins and pesticides and all of these is already quite well evaluated. And they're standard tests, I will say. However, for allergens, they're not standardized tests. You have to know what you're looking for and be quite innovative in identifying. And we found that crocodiles and fish sharing the same allerg allergens, unfortunately, mm -hmm. And we have frequently Australian tourists going overseas, eating crocodile and having uh, uh, allergic reactions, which is actually two cross-reactive fish allergens. Oh, and not yeah. understanding why. Yeah, it's and so important then. Yes. And particularly with all the plant-based mm. foods even, you don't really know. Uh, true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what are some current projects or initiatives that you're involved in and excited mm. about? Yeah, the di diagnostic work we do are cons constantly doing and improving diagnostics, um, identifying, characterizing molecules on a molecular level. But I think our recent work with the National University Hospital here in Singapore, developing an immunotherapy mm -hmm. for uh, people with shellfish allergy or prawn allergy, particular shrimps, prawns. So that's, I think, very exciting because it's the first study in the world. Oh, Nobody wow. else is doing this, not even in the US or Europe. The second one, I think the novel <laughs> proteins uh, we are doing, again, we are the first one identifying what allergens are there and how many are there. And is mm -hmm. it less than the, in the normal uh, seafood, mm -hmm. the cultivated seafood? And we are publishing very soon our first, first uh, findings, which will definitely help to get cultivated seafood also here on the dish in, in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Singapore was the first one three years ago to register actually uh, cultivated chicken. Yep. Uh, so this was the first in the world and we hope to be also the first for cultivated fish here in Singapore. My goodness, yes. I'm hearing a lot of this cutting edge stuff coming across. Is that part of the favorite part of your job? What is what's, What would you consider mm. the favorite part of your job? Yeah, I think for me, identifying always new opportunities coming across. And, and I think Singapore is really great sitting in the middle of Asia mm. with all these uh, uh, fast drive and fast pace in different areas. 
but it only can really achieve through engaged students. You yeah. know, student engagement is absolutely. I mean, when we talk about me, the leader, it's it's a teamwork. Mm -hmm. It's a team effort, and we have teams in Australia and in uh, Singapore, okay. and I still work with my ex students, which are now in China, in Indonesia. So we are they're still having close collaboration and working in similar fields or sometimes identical fields. Mm. We're looking by discovery of marine organisms, antimicrobial peptides, which are now everywhere, also after COVID reading being discussed. So we're branching even into other areas out, uh, looking still at marine organisms and how they can help uh, humankind. My goodness, you're building up your whole international mm. own, own <laughs> international network. <laughs> Tell us one particularly memorable research finding. Yeah, one particular one, uh, I probably would say that's what I started many years ago, started off in South Africa work on insects mm -hmm. and this uh, metabolism looking biomolec biomolecular molecules, I will say, in, in flying beetles I did at the time. Now I can revive this knowledge and still looking again as insects but as a food source ah. so also singapore we registered recently i think over 10 different species of insects which can be now traded and eaten here mm -hmm. in singapore but also worldwide in europe it's a mealworm it's which is now on a menu in in many restaurants and can mealworms replace. don't sound appetizing they I don't sound terrible <laughs> but normally you don't eat the whole worm as it is they get processed to little hamburgers or some some products so again, looking at uh, alternative proteins, and that's exactly what we follow up now from my very, very old research now, reviving it. And I think that's quite exciting that we I can stay in the same field and using knowledge from the past to uh, make a better future. I think it's not everyone who can say that they can use their own old PhD research to continue. That's, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> if you're able to travel back in time, what advice would you give to your younger mm. self? Yeah, that's a good thing. A, a good question, because I mean, a lot of people would say I would have done this different or this different. And I must say, I everything comes as it comes. Mm. Uh, basically, the the one th advice I would give to everybody is trying different things out. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't st st stick to one pathway, because you you know, you get a better job or more money or better job opportunities. That's for us for me never ever the drive mm -hmm. uh, There was my passion and you only can find your passion I think when you try different things out and then once you find your passion everything else is easy it's very easy uh, it sounds mm -hmm. sounds a little bit techy but <laughs> I think it's it's really true and pathways that can be very different like in my case from business school all the way to seafood allergy which it's a long way coming along even alongside with some insects in between mm -hmm. so yes I think the passion is the main thing you have to find try different things out it might take longer as you think but once you find it, just stick to it and uh, uh, yes, don't lose faith in what you want to do. Fantastic. <clears throat> I've heard you say before, once you find your real passion, happy life, happy research. Co uh, correct. Abs <laughs> absolutely. Because happy life is at home, it's your friends, it's your family uh, and uh, the career comes automatically, I would say. And then there is no question when you work on the weekends on some research papers or you find some new ideas or looking for grants or for new students to come into the team. That's all part of uh, the the pathway, I will say, yeah, to go somewhere. Well, I hope you have some time looking for mm. more novel foods on the weekends as well. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> so this has been a fantastic discussion, Professor Lapata. Thank you so much for being here with mm. us. Where can listeners find you online? Yeah, that's, I think the easiest here, it's the Tropical Futures Institute here at James Cook University in Singapore. We have a very nice website, uh, all the details, not only of my research group, but also other research group in the health science, well-being, as well as aquaculture. We all work very close together in the different areas. So go to the Tropical Futures Institute and you will find my contact details. Thank you. Yeah. I hope everyone has good fun trying to find Andreas, learning more about novel yeah. foods. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.